Recording is on. All right, so today is June 6, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata extinction Adi. Uh, Hugh, how, do you want to start it off? How, how do you want to engage the interview? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think everybody knows who Eric McBay is. Um, he's a writer and an author who's written um, Deep Green Resistance with um, Leah Keith and Derek Jensen. And uh, he's also just come out with Full Spectrum Resistance, uh, volume one and two. And so I think that's what we're gonna really base our discussion on. I think everybody, this audience understands, we pretty much doomers and we kind of understand the, the requirement for Full Spectrum Resistance. So I think we can advance the conversation and get onto you know, more of the nuts and bolts of it and make some assumptions that everybody understands what what the basics are and what the necessity is. But okay, so let, let me, since I'm started, let me kick off with, with the first question I've got. And that that's, I think that a response to the ecological emergency and the climate emergency is really based on what you personally feel is the situation, how far gone it is, how much time we have. And so, you know, some people think that we can, you know, we have until 2100 that you get these kind of articles in the Guardian that says, you know, 10% of the global GDP will be, have to go for climate change by 2100. And it's like drastic underreporting. Um, and then you get all the way to people like Guy McPherson, <laughs> we all toast by 2026. But um, so I did a little experiment on Extinction Rebellion. We have, we kind of stalk Extinction Rebellion <laughs> an awful lot. Um, and I just asked them, uh, did a little poll and said, do you think, or what year do you think will be, the situation will be too far gone uh, to make a difference with activism? So climate activism has a shelf life what do you think that shelf life is? And most people said by 2025 to 2030, going at the current rate without any change, the game will be over. It'll be pointless doing any more climate activism. And then there was a split right down the middle. And the rest thought that, you know, oh, there isn't going to have any, any bad consequences till about 2100. And so then it means you, you have plenty of time for doing Marxism and eco-socialism and, you know, a whole raft of things, which you just don't do if you've got like five years. So, so can you start by saying how bad do you think the situation and just put a shelf life on it? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think the situation is quite a bit more dire than, than a deadline of something like 2100. Um, I've been doing climate justice activism since I was a teenager. And the situation has gotten dramatically worse in that time period, right? Um, it's not like we've been, in general, the climate movement has not been buying us more time. Things have been getting worse. Um, I think we're, we're already on the cusp of, of the point of no return, depending on, on who you count as valuable, right? I mean, even the United Nations um, acknowledges that Currently, if we if we stop emitting greenhouse gases, um, most of the planet's coral reefs are likely to be destroyed in the next few decades, um, and that is uh, that's huge. Those areas are some of the most important areas on the planet for biodiversity, um, and many cultures still depend on them for their livelihoods. So to say, oh, we have till twenty one hundred. I mean, that's ignoring the, the needs of the vast majority of, of living creatures on Earth and the vast majority of cultures on Earth. To say we have till 2100 takes into account only the need of the capitalist ruling class, essentially, right? I mean, that's, that's what that assumption is based on, that you can continue to kind of render extinct entire biomes on the planet, just destroy entire biomes, entire cultures, entire peoples and that doesn't count for them um, as the point of no return so that ultimately i mean that assumption is is leading us to a future where we have um 
you know, a bunch of technocrats like Elon Musk saying it's fine because we're going to go live on Mars or a bunch of kind of capitalists slash fascists who think, oh, eventually we can we can just keep retreating. We'll retreat from the sea and eventually we can retreat to the poles if the tropics and and so on become uninhabitable. Right. And that's not a future that has room for most of the, the humans, the other living creatures and most of the cultures that exist now and that have existed through history. So if instead we start from the perspective that um, cultures, especially indigenous and traditional cultures are valuable, that other life forms than humans are valuable, then, I mean, we're already in an apocalyptic time period. Um, we're already um, at a point where there have been enormous, traumatic, um, irrecoverable losses. And that's going to continue as long as we imagine that Capitalism is the only kind of society that matters, the only kind of society that counts. Um, I would say, yeah, I would say we're currently at, at a major tipping point. Um, and that's partly because of the pandemic, right? The pandemic has upset a lot of the kind of established cultural norms, a lot of the things that people take for granted. And it's also disrupted the basic functioning of capitalism, right? Um, you know, I, I live on a farm where we're, we grow most of our own food. We're self-sufficient in a lot of ways, but it's become really clear even how hard it is to get replacement parts right now for basic equipment because the global supply chains have been so disrupted. So that means that um, there's also an opportunity in right, right now that um, there's an opportunity to really shift the way that the world is kind of reconstructed and rebuilt. Um, as this pandemic starts to a close. So now really is the moment to take um, appropriate action to the scale of the problem. And so that might sound like a grim assessment, but at the same time, I really do believe in the power of, of activism. I believe in the power of social movements and the power of resistance movements. And I think if we see serious movements taking serious action and people of privilege taking risks, then we can actually buy ourselves a lot of time in terms of the, the climate emergency, right? Um, that's something that I saw in, in my own life at the beginning of, of 2020 um, here in so-called Canada. Um, indigenous people who were defending their land from pipeline developments on the West Coast, uh, uh, the Wet'suwet'en, decided that they were really fed up with police and government invading their lands and building oil pipelines and fracking pipelines without permission. Um, and so as they stood up for themselves, indigenous people across the, you know, the continent stood up with them and blocked railroads, um, blocked pipeline infrastructure, blocked highways, blocked bridges, and, and really shut down just before the pandemic a lot of the fundamental infrastructure in this country. I mean, the whole rail network was shut down in a way that it hasn't been since it was built. There is power there to, to stop the climate emergency in its tracks, to ensure that we can have a livable future um, for, for everyone, not just for capitalist plutocrats, but for many different cultures, um, if we're willing to take that kind of action, right? And, and that's one of the things that showed me how powerful it is, is that it was really a small number of people. There were a few thousand people across the country taking that kind of action. And if we had tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, then we could put an end to the, to the climate emergency, I think, in short order. So you talk about a win, but what does a win look like? I mean, I, I just assume there is a mass movement and the and resistance is successful. What does it look like after that? I think that it looks like a bunch of different things. Um, so if we're talking about kind of transforming the society that we live in, then I think one of the most fundamental things that we probably all agree on is that no new fossil fuel infrastructure can be built. This, you know, all societies have to stop building new oil pipelines, new coal mines, new refineries, all of these things, that has to come to an end to ensure a livable future. Um, I also think it means that we have to stop taking capitalism for granted. Capitalism is a terrible system um, that has proliferated 
in the kind of post World War II years, basically through um, through warfare and skullduggery, right? Through proxy wars by the United States, and also through um, the undermining of democratic governments all over the world, right? I mean, the CIA famously has over has overthrown what I think it's more than fifty in documented uh, cases of democratically elected governments in order to put in um, often military governments or fascist governments who were in favor of, uh, um, you know, American is American ideals and capitalism. So we have to move away from that. We have to recognize that capitalism is going to keep doing what it's been doing since the beginning, which is concentrating wealth into the hands of a small number of people at the expense of everyone else and the planet. Um, we can't take capitalism for granted, and we should be doing whatever we can to contain its damage. Um, that's looking at kind of fixing some of the damage from the last hundred years. But I, I think we also have to go deeper than that. I think overturning colonialism is really critical. So, you know, I'm wearing this orange shirt today, um, and that's actually not a coincidence. Um, I live just east of Kingston, Ontario, um, a town, uh, a city that was the birthplace of Sir John A. Macdonald, Canada's first prime minister, and the person responsible for um, building the system of residential schools um, that imprisoned and traumatized millions of Indigenous people in Canada and killed um, uncounted numbers. Um, there's been uh, a recent resurgence in awareness in the past week because a mass grave of 215 children was discovered near a residential school. And, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of apologists for John A. Macdonald and for that system like to say, well, that's all in the past. You know, what, what can you do that's in the past? And clearly it's, it's not. Um, and I think that's really critical to understand that um, if we're going to have a future that is livable and that is fair, then Indigenous people here and around the world have to have sovereignty and they have to have reparations, frankly. Um, they need to be um, compensated for the damage that has been done to them, the intergenerational trauma, the, the resources and lands that have been stolen. Because despite all of that trauma, despite that history of genocide, Indigenous cultures are still by far the best equipped to um, to guide us into a world of, of ecological equality, right? Into a livable future. And often people who are newer than you to this will come to me and say, well, you know, if we just come, if we build eco villages, if we come up with a really good example, then we're sure to win over those in power or we're sure to win, we're sure to win over, you know, the general public. And, you know, these continents were covered with, with sustainable, you know, eco villages, if you want to call them that, um, that indigenous people built for, for tens of thousands of years. And that didn't stop the colonizers from, the, the colonizers learned very little, if anything, from that example. So I think those are, are kind of the three big things that I would identify as essential and decisive, that no new fossil fuel infrastructure, um, to, to turn away from capitalism and build new systems, and to, to have a genuine reckoning with that colonial past especially with indigenous people, but, um, you know, in many parts of the world as well with slavery and, and other kinds of entrenched racialized injustice. So do you Can see, I... oh yeah, sorry, you... go ahead. Sorry. I to follow up on what you were saying, um, because um, I am also, uh, I've, I've grown my own food for, for 30 years and I, I'm also close to all this, but um, I think we forget to say that if these movements uh, can stop uh, mining fossil fuels and repair the damage of colonialism. I think we need to touch also to the the way we we eat, the way the industry, uh, and the whole the whole civilization. So our group is is talking a lot about about uh, uh, the collapse of this civilization. And uh, not only uh, preparing for it, but also uh, analyzing the, the root problems of the of the place of the human in in on the planet and what what has become to, what the human has has become. And I think that we 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 think in terms of um, 
we think in terms that we, we're not very optimistic in the terms of, of survival of the human species and uh, the indigenous people who are still living um, in in uh, <laughs> ideal eco villages are the best equipped to survive what's going to come, you know. So, um, in the view of that, my my it's not really a question. I'm saying, but I think we need to we need to turn a little bit about, and I'd be interested to hear what you have to say about about this civilization, this civilization where we are, and um, this, we've talked about it with Derek and Lear, and we we're approaching things from a. a Accelerate, accelerate collapse so that we can save as many people as possible um, and those big movements we're not too optimistic about that we, we don't think that the way those movements are going to, are going to be uh, organized is the same way that all movements have been organized which means coming back to control and coming back to not let um, let things happen as they should if I, sorry, I might not be expressing myself here because I'm a bit tired today, but uh, that's all I have to say. <laughs> okay, I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I think I think what you're saying makes sense and that, um, you know, ultimately, we do need to accelerate the, the, the collapse of capitalism, um, the collapse of, of this kind of industrial economy that's based on destroying the planet, that's based on continuous exploitation. And I think as, as part of that, you know, as you've said, it's crucial that we um, build and, and support and reinvigorate communities that are ecologically integrated and that believe in community sufficiency, right? Where it is possible to sustain ourselves with our basic needs. Um, yeah, and I think that the last 15 months have shown that the kind of stereotype of preppers as people who like, stockpile a bunch of canned food or whatever, that's never going to work because actual disasters, actual catastrophes last a long time. I mean, think of how long, you know, this pandemic has felt so far. Imagine a catastrophe that goes on for, for five generations or 10 generations, right? I mean, you've got to have that kind of ecological basis or, or you don't have anything or your movement doesn't have anything ultimately. But do, do you see the industrial system surviving? Do you think it can be reformed? Or do you think we have to get rid of uh, machines, basically? I mean, I don't know that we as social movements have the power to get rid of machines. Um, I think at this point there are, um, I mean, there's a lot of refined metal around. I do metal fabrication in my in my shop, right? and it's pretty easy to set up a small blacksmith kind of uh, equipment and and actually and genuinely recycle things like steel um, into useful stuff. Um, but for me, machines are not machines themselves are not the, the primary problem. Um, I mean, when you get into huge, huge scale infrastructure, that's a different thing, right? Like if you're talking about um, you know, uh, an international network of, uh, of electricity infrastructure that relies on, you know, just in time delivery from factories in China and um, oil that's extracted from the tar sands in Alberta and all these different places, that inevitably is gonna turn into a disaster system because you can't build a system like that without centuries of colonialism and without concentrating wealth and ignoring the needs of people who already live there in the planet. I think for other tools and machines, I don't feel necessarily the same way about that. I think that you can have lots of tools and machines on a scale that is actually responsive to the needs of communities, um, right? And I think that um, a lot of indigenous cultures were very, uh, have, you know, before kind of invasion, were very effective at things like metalworking, um, and that was part of their their culture as well. So I see it more a matter of the big picture systems being the problem and that if you can actually create um, create communities that are that are fair and that are kind of embedded in their ecology in a way that's non-destructive, that actually supports the ecology, then in the future, a lot of those detailed questions will answer themselves, like what kinds of machines make sense for us as a community. So uh, what do you feel about the population? I mean, uh, so 
you've you've said that basically the world doesn't really support 10 billion people and we're going to get to 10 maybe 11 um how do you answer people because you know you get accused, well i mean we get accused of being eco-fascist very quickly just by talking about the and even though we're not being racist or anything like Monboy says, you know, it's racist to talk about it. It's like, no, we're talking about the impact factor of 10 billion people. And, we, you know, the biggest impact is Westerners, you know, white Westerners. So it's it's nothing to do with racism. It's just being realistic. And so it, once you get through the denialism or collapse denialism and, you know, oh, we're going to do vertical farming and plant food is going to come out of the air. It's just like, come on, dudes, this, none of this is going to happen. We're in deep, deep trouble. So, so you know, it's you can be a narco-primitivist, but you can go Amish. But the problem is 10 or 11 billion people can't go Amish. And then that's the nitty-gritty of the conversation that really bogs down there. Well, how do you approach this? So... For me, as an, as an organizer, one of the questions I'm always asking is, what's the next problem that we can, can address? Or what's the next problem we can solve? What's the next problem we can tackle? And use that to build our movement capacity and kind of build our momentum, right? And so for me, I mean, you're, you're right that the main issue is really consumption, that people in the, in the wealthy world, and especially wealthy people in the wealthy world, are just consuming way more than the vast majority of humans on the planet. And so um, for me, that's the thing to start with. That's the thing to tackle, is how do we reduce that consumption? Um, because the you know, people in, uh, in Bangladesh who are using something like 5% of the, of the greenhouse gas emissions as someone in Canada, I'm actually not that concerned about that. That will, it'll be a long time before there that contribution is is a major problem. Um, for me, it's a question of how can we stop those really wealthy people from destroying land that doesn't belong to them. I think that in the that the question of how do we get people to kind of live in balance with their land base, um, you know, I think that will actually happen automatically. As if we can overturn colonialism. I think that'll happen automatically if you can stop some people from exploiting and destroying other people's land bases. Um, there's a great book called uh, Late Victorian Holocausts, which I, I don't have a copy of um, to show you, but it, it, it's by Mike Davis, a history professor. Um, and it explores the food systems of, of the world before, uh, before colonization, essentially. So it looks at food systems in India and in China and to some extent in, in the Americas um, before a period of, of climate disruption in the late 1800s. And uh, the book makes it very clear that all of those places had really sophisticated food systems that were designed to, to kind of um, feed people through ecological disruption, through seasonal drought, through all of that stuff, and to keep people in balance, essentially, to make sure that the, that the, the food was available for the, for the number of people they had. Um, and, you know, European settlers came in and destroyed all of those food systems, of course, as we know, and took advantage of a climate disruption to do that. Um, but I think if you get rid of that, uh, if that kind of now mostly capitalist kind of occupying force and actually give local people autonomy um, over their land and that they're not forced to kind of just give in to whatever capitalists want through the to the IMF or the World Bank or, or whatnot, then I think people will actually rebuild those systems. Um, you know, I think we've seen that many indigenous communities have tried to do that. Here we see with the, the African diaspora um, you know, people brought forcibly to, to America, that they still brought seeds, they still brought kind of the fundamentals of their food system with them. There's a huge uh, movement in, in India, you know, Vandana Shiva's work. Um, I, I really do think that if we can deal with our, our own house, which for me is, you know, I live in a, in a wealthy, mostly white capitalist country, if we can kind of tackle those problems, then that will actually free up the space for, for some of these other problems to, to be solved locally by the people who are, who are making those decisions. 
as you know, I'm as a grassroots organizer, I'm I'm very much in favor of people being given the tools to solve their own problems because they usually do. You know, we we see that with with population numbers as well around the world. When women have access to reproductive health care, they usually choose to have fewer children because that's what makes sense for them in their in their own lives, right? Um, so I think it's a matter of 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 addressing these kinds of big overarching dominating systems and that will naturally free up space to solve these problems in a way that makes sense in different communities in different biomes in different cultures and so on but i've worked for years in family planning i was a doctor in uh, women's health and i i've seen that reproductive um, health care is essentially based on the on the in, in industri industrial pharmaceutical system apart from even the fabrication of coins, uh, copper and plastic, uh, the pill, I mean, most of what all is offered, and I've worked with deprived communities, most that is offered in terms of reproductive uh, con birth control is totally depending on the, on the pharmaceutical and the industrial system. We, we have not implemented something that's sustainable and something that is traditional in that area. So what we're importing to India and Africa in terms of reproduction systems is exactly what we have here with all the side effects and the problems we get from them. So we, we're turning a bit in a circle. I, I was thinking that what we, we talk about, um, we, you talk about capitalism and you talk about getting rid of, of colonialism, but we're, we're talking about getting rid of the state, number one. Um, I think that is, that, is par that is more important than, because otherwise you, you are, <laughs> You, you're going to you're going to turn into people who are going to do another an, another another system similar to that. You, you're not addressing uh, the, the the importance of localization and living local, um, the possibility of living without continuous electricity supply, the the possibility of living with a health system that will not enable people to live until ninety, uh, maybe or eighty. The people that, that, that would not treat every disease. The, you know that sort. We're looking at this sort of thing, and it's it's a much bigger thing to swallow. For most people, um, I don't know what is your position on that. Yeah, I think for me, um, I am not gonna. I, I'm not gonna put you know getting rid of the state or getting rid of capitalism as as kind of a hierarchy. I think for me, it's um, for me. This, the capitalism is more monolithic than the state now. I think that capitalism, that that economic system, um, has really, in most of the world, shaped the development of the state. That that makes it kind of a primary actor. Um, so, for example, here where I live, capitalism and the uh, and and the corporation predate the the state, right? So the Hudson's Bay Company came in. All of these companies came into to kind of North America to exploit resources, and then and they basically owned most of most of the country. Um, and similar for for many railroad companies. And so the state was kind of set up almost as an afterthought to keep things tidy and to kind of serve a lot of the functions that the corporations didn't want to do because they weren't getting paid for it, right? Um, but yes, I think in Europe it's different. In in old Europe, we we have, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think there is, you know, when based on where we're operating, clearly we're going to have kind of different priorities um, based on what is what is kind of the prime mover of control or oppression or domination and the extent to which we can actually disentangle colonialism, the state and capitalism, which I think often we can't. I think, you know, at this point there um, often uh, Kind of fundamentally the same the same thing so can, can you let's go back and can, let's try to make this really realistic can you put a timeline on on what you think you we could achieve if we use full spectrum resistance and you just no hold bars approach and you didn't have to have any barriers to educating the population to the necessity Give us a timeline of like what could we achieve by 2025, by 2030? Because you know, I, I think we might be in planetary hospice already. We might be doing a rearguard action. <laughs> I think we should still do it, but I think we should be realistic about what we're going to achieve. Because I mean, I, I think part of 
Well, okay, let me just come out and say it. I think people are delusional. That we really, I think there were big tipping points in 2020. You can see the Arctic tipping. You can see the clath rates are bubbling out of the Arctic. You, the, the Amazon became a net emitter. You mentioned, you mentioned the, uh, you know, the Barrier Reef and the, the reefs are, are tipped. I mean, we're talking even the, the kelp and stuff. That there, there seem to be, you know, the runaway fires in the in the Arctic. You can see the slow burn of the, of the. Um, basically the tundra venting methane you can see these feedback loops it looks like we passed the tipping point so we should do uh, you know even if it's a hail mary pass we should do everything we can but i think we've got to be realistic and people don't don't want to talk about the system in toto they're still talking about it like it's 1970 and we can have a parallel polis and we can do regenerative agriculture and say no look let's be realistic Where's Joe Biden? Where's Xi Jinping in all of this? I mean, the four horsemen are riding in here. We, I mean, it's easy to see. We've already got the pandemic. It's pretty easy to see that food insecurity and water insecurity is coming maybe this year. And it's very easy to see it'll be resolved in a, in a war. It's very, you know, war leads naturally on from that just to distract the population, just to distract this kind of full spectrum if, you know, you can clear the youth off the streets, rebellious youth off the streets just by drafting them. And that's traditionally what every every country has done. So if you're talking about this accelerated time frame where things are going to crap very, very fast, um, you know, sure, you need a contingency and you need mutual aid and you need some, some kind of survival that's beyond prepping. But, I mean, let's be realistic, is how much of this system can we reform and how much do we just have to just go flat out to convince people that if you can monkey wrench it you should because it's it's going to kill us yeah so i think in the in the scenario that you're asking about if if it's not an issue to convince people about the nature of the emergency and to convince people about the kinds of tactics that we should be using then i think we actually can you know, in that scenario, there's no reason that we couldn't stop new fossil fuel developments across much of the planet, right? Um, I mean, certainly in in where I live in so-called Canada, um, the, the organizing that was happening at the beginning of 2020, that level of disruption of the transportation system, um, if it weren't for the pandemic, I expect that that would have kept on growing. Um, you know, the, the pandemic, unfortunately, really disrupted that um, in, a, in a negative way. Um, but I think once you've got that kind of momentum, if you can actually build that momentum, you can accomplish things very quickly. Um, and I think that's often the case in historical changes and historical revolutions, right? There might be decades or generation of pushing and then when change happens, it actually sometimes does happen very quickly in the space of a few years. Um, and so I think once we get to that point of actually building momentum and have, having strong movements, of having intersectional movements that are using diverse tactics and supporting each other, then there's no reason that by 2025, we couldn't stop um, the majority of new fossil fuel projects from being built. There's no reason that by the end of 2030, we couldn't be, um, you know, shutting down existing fossil fuel infrastructure like coal mines or tar sands that are especially destructive. Um, I think there's there's nothing unrealistic about that timeline, given uh, strong movements that are actually supporting each other and treating, treating things as a genuine emergency. Um, and I think that is, <sighs> You know, that is maybe one of the opportunities of the current moment. And I think that's one of the reasons that Black Lives Matter in, in the United States has gained so much ground in the last year, right? That's an example of a movement where people had been organizing, I mean, clearly for, for decades, but really, really for generations um, to, to kind of build toward that movement. And the pandemic, instead of making people afraid or making them retreat, it made it clear to everyone, hey, this is a big emergency that isn't going to go away. So let's all act like it's an emergency. And so Black Lives Matter has gained an enormous amount of ground because of that, because they've been able to kind of operate in the context of this emergency. And I think that's a lesson that 
that other kinds of movements should be thinking about in, as well, is to look for those, uh, to, to, to think about not how do we operate in kind of normal times, but how do we operate during emergencies? How do we operate during catastrophes that are going to become more and more a feature of our, our daily lives um, for the foreseeable future? Um, and I, I think that's often, you know, there's a book um, by, uh, by Gamson called The Strategy of Social Movements, I think it is, that I, that I write about in, in Full Spectrum Resistance. And he argues that basically any social movement um, in, that can kind of keep its stuff together, that can keep itself um, organized and, and active up to a major emergency, it's likely to get what, it's, what it wants. It's likely to achieve at least some of its goals because of that, um, because uh, basically those, those in power um, can't afford the existential threat. They, they will try to give in. And so I think in a timeline or in a scenario where we're talking about, um, you know, a really powerful, really powerful intersectional movements being um, strong and being effective, our biggest risk is actually co-optation by, by those in power. Um, that if the movement is so strong that it can't be repressed effectively, then the biggest risk is that those in power will try to give concessions that are meant to, to take the steam out of the, that movement, right? That are meant to say, okay, you've won, now you can give up without going that, that far. Um, and of course, there are many examples of that in history. I think the example of, of South Africa is one to be aware of that, that the, the ANC, the African National Congress and other movements against apartheid achieved um, really huge successes in many ways, but um, they weren't able to kind of take control of the country's financial systems effectively. And so as a result, they were never able to, or they had not yet been able to bring about a lot of the other kind of sweeping changes that they'd hoped for. And maybe it was impossible for them to get that in that moment, um, but, you know, concessions like that can be really dangerous. And there's a reason that those in power use kind of selective concessions as a way to undermine movements or especially to split movements into different uh, fragments, because that's how um, typically how a powerful movement is, is dealt with, right? It's divide and conquer. You, you give kind of a concession to one part of it. And then if you can split the really radical people off or the really militant people off, then they can just be dealt with through violent repression, through COINTELPRO, through secret police, all of that. Yeah, so I'm, I, I grew up in South Africa, so I, I lived through apartheid. So all my references are from South Africa. And then maybe I color things overly in, in terms of South Africa. So, so let me put it in terms of South Africa, how I see things. It's, it's like on, on the timeline that we seem to be on in, in activism and social change, I see that there's a vast disconnect and there's a big cognitive disconnect on what's realistic on activism, even full spectrum, and where where we at in terms of the destruction to the planet. So I put the destruction of the planet is very near term. We, we're heading for catastrophe. So there are two things I think that the movement is really missing here. One of them is they thinking in terms of this retrograde thing like MLK and Gandhi and all these references, which are entirely inappropriate. And they're thinking in terms of the civil rights movement, it's entirely inappropriate to, to this battle, which is existential and based on entrenched interest. I can, you know, I can show you the business case for why MLK, you know, basically MLK, I think, ended in the subprime loan crisis. You could see that it was beneficial to the bankers to have black people banked and they wanted them as good debt slaves. So you can see why MLK succeeded. I'll show you the business case. Now, this is the opposite business case. It's, it's more like in South Africa that says, like, you're in an ultimate loss. So it's, it's a last stand um, engagement. And if you have a look in the South African case, we're at, the ANC started in about 1900. We're at about 1900. It took 94 years. Now, we haven't got that in terms of the climate. In terms of the ecological destruction, we don't have 94 years. When the ANC started to get militant, it split the ANC on the lines of pacifism and aggression. And as you know, you wrote about Mandela and you got that right, that Mandela was 
spent 32 years in jail, not because he was MLK, it's because of his involvement in the Ravonia bomb plot where civilians died. So he's basically bin Laden. <laughs> so, so, you know, basically, at the point when they went bin Laden, let's call it, that, that, that split, uh, split the movement. They were absolutely right, but that was in about 62. And, and they still had another 30 years to go on that path. Now, that we're talking about 80% of the population against 20% of the white population, and even then half the white population was against apartheid. So we're talking about 10% who had money and guns held the country for another 30 years after a violent insurrection, which we haven't even got to yet. The, the time and this, the procedure, I think, is just completely unrealistic. People, people have to get more serious and decide what, where this comes in uh, and where, where these stages come in and basically saying that at some point you just got to go all out. And I think we're already there, but I accept that that might be a radical extreme position and other people don't have it. But you at least have to say, like, it's not about doing something, you know, in nice liberal democracies. It's really all about China. And China said already that they're not going to do anything in terms of uh, reduction of CO2 emissions uh, until 2030. So they've signed our death warrant. So you might as well say, unless we get China to stop, we're doomed. It doesn't matter what we do in the West and in, in what we do in terms of activism on the streets or COINTEL ops or Occupy movement or Extinction Rebellion. All of those have been co-opted. They've all been steered into a Green New Deal and uh, you know, basically this bright green lies and stuff. And so they've, they've taken the whole ecological movement and the resistance movement and turned it into a pacifist thing about windmills and solar panels. And on the path of windmills and solar panels, we're a thousand years, not even 93. So it's like, come on, guys, let's get real. You've got to say, like, what can we do on a global scale that can even infiltrate China and, and basically address it there just as, as a last-ditch attempt and something on a 10-year timeline? What do you say? Is that too radical or extremist? Or I mean, I think we could lose, right? I mean, you're right. It's that's that's a totally plausible scenario that um, that at this point, not enough change will happen to kind of preserve the Earth as a habitable place for for humans and other living creatures. That's a perfectly plausible scenario and maybe it's even the most likely scenario in some ways. Um, I think for me, I often come back to it as as an organizer, you know, given the given the condition that we're in, given the, the tools that we have, what can we do to increase the probability of a future that where we survive of a livable future? Um, and I, um, I don't, I, I don't work with a lot of organizers in China. Um, I know that there are, I mean, there are very powerful movements kind of simmering under the surface in China right now and powerful, um, you know, powerful dissident movements. And the fact that China is, China is being propped up in a lot of ways by international capitalism, right? It's the most, it's the most capitalist country in the world um, in some respects. Yeah, the state capitalist. I mean, everybody's a state capitalist now, aren't they, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I do think, and that's a, that's a long thing going back, right? I mean, one of the other things that I write about in Full Spectrum Resistance in the second volume is that history of, of attempted revolutions in China before the communist revolution. That since the opium wars, there, were, there was a hundred years of attempted revolutions over and over. Um, you know, sometimes there would be like five or six of them going on at the same time in different parts of China. Um, that were put down essentially by by the West. Um, that you know, at various points, kind of internal uh, governments were not enough to stand up to that, and and the West would would send in mercenaries or would send in the navy or send in its own army. Um, and I genuinely believe that if we can build movements around the world that can can challenge the dominance of the state or capitalism or colonialism where we live that that will actually help free up possibilities and free up opportunities for people in, in China and and all around the world. So but I think that, sorry, go ahead. But what do you mean by challenge the dominance? I mean, it's, it's, you know, these are the guys with the guns and the money. 
It, yeah. Are we deluding ourselves that we're challenging their dominance? I mean, they don't, I'm sure they don't feel challenged. If we all go up to Thacker Pass and basically blockade the road so that they can't do the lithium mine, it's like it's a minor inconvenience to them. It's 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 not it's not even really a nuisance. All it means is you raise the cost of lithium. It's not even bad from their point of view. The cost of lithium being higher that might mean they get more profits. It's it's kind of, it, isn't it a bit naive to look at it this way? Is we aren't we all deluding ourselves that we actually are resisting? We're not hurting them at all. We're not stopping their project. They factoring they work from a cost benefit analysis, right? Unless and we're, you not, are we're not costing them anything. You have to go underground. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of working my way through the arguments <laughs> to, to a proposition on this subject. You, you're leaping ahead. I'm trying to steer Eric <laughs> into, into uh, this kind of radical. So, yeah, since we go there, I'll, okay, I'll come clean. I say, and what I'm trying to say is, like, I get the feeling like even talking about the debate that we get, you know, you've got known as the violence guy and things like that. And you say, when you start talking about full spectrum resistance, you know, there's a big freeze. Everybody's, you know, militantly pacifists, and so uh, it's it's this fetish about uh, nonviolence and stuff, and it's it's like entirely inappropriate to the existential threat that we face, and it's largely based on over domestication and privilege and stuff like that. But ignoring all that, isn't it wrong to start with saying full spectrum resistance is the tools? We first have to say what the job is, and then we can say what the tools are. And I propose straight out that the, all the harm is being caused by the industrial uh, system. So it's basically industrial production, no matter what underpins it, capitalism or state communism or any other system, it's we cannot have this industrial machine. This industrial machine cannot be made green. It cannot be reformed. It, it's extractive. It can't basically be be made sustainable through recycling, you, you can't decouple it from nature. So let's just big up and say the, the industrial machine, this industrial culture just cannot carry on making these machines. The machines are not sustainable. So when you say that, then you say, well, we have to de-industrialize. And then that, that is a big no-no. But I think that's where we're at. And you have to face that nobody's going to do a voluntary de-industrialization. But if you can make it to the mindset where you say we have to deindustrialize, then it becomes, you know, how do we do an involuntary mass deindustrialization and rapidly? And then you start looking at the tools to do it. But don't we have to get to there? And am I completely off base with my analysis that that's the heart of the problem? I don't think you're completely off base, um, but there are a couple of things that I want to touch on from from the last few minutes that I think are important to kind of finding finding solutions to these to these issues that we can actually implement. Um, and one of which is that, um, you know, I think that you're right that that those in power are are not really feeling threatened by movements like Extinction Rebellion in general. Um, and I think that that's for a a bunch of reasons, but one of them is that, you know, Extinction Rebellion kind of takes for granted the, the continuation of, of business as usual in most respects, right, other than the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I think it's also because Extinction Rebellion, um, a lot of people in Extinction Rebellion thinks that police are our friends. Right. Um, they think that they're the getting police... over that. They're touchy about that. Now, right? <laughs> they know enough to be a fearful chasing on that. Side. I I hope so, um, because you can often tell you can tell if someone is considered a threat by those in power in part by how the police treat them. Right. So if the police are are really gentle with them, um, as they often have been with Extinction Rebellion, um, depending on the context, then that that often shows that the police don't really consider you a threat. Whereas if we look at movements by by people of color, then the response of the state of police of, of white supremacist vigilantes, you know, that's very different. Um, I would say that that climate justice movements that are organized by indigenous people in, in Canada, which is where I, you know, have this have the most knowledge and context, those movements absolutely terrify the government absolutely terrify corporate interests. 
Um, those people in power are desperately afraid of those movements gaining ground because they know that they can't actually repress them effectively um, because they know that, you know, they've been trying to destroy indigenous cultures through violence for, for 500 years and it hasn't worked. Um, and they can continue to use violent repression and it's not going to snuff out indigenous movements. Those movements are gonna continue no matter what. And if they get more and more support, um, then they will continue to grow in their effectiveness. And I think something is similar for, for Black Lives Matter in, in the United States um, and in, in other countries as well, that the government actually is really afraid of Black Lives Matter. Um, and that's one of the reasons that they continue to experience this level of police violence. Um, and we've seen that in other examples that we've kind of touched on, like the example of the, the ANC, um, the examples of the civil rights movement. I mean, the violent repression of those movements was enormous because the government did see them as a threat and the governments, um, governments did use both kind of selective concessions. They both tried to con get, offer concessions and co-op those movements at the same time as they offered violence. And so if the question is, do I think that white people of privilege are gonna be able to build a movement that's gonna overturn capitalism or industrialism in short order in order to save the planet? The answer is no, absolutely not. Like the majority of, of white people of privilege are never gonna confront a system that has given them enormous benefits, enormous wealth. And that might be you know, short term in the context of the climate emergency. But I think in general, um, you know, their, their kind of loyalties are clear. Do I think on the other hand that movements that are rooted in communities of color that never accepted those governments in the first place, that never really accepted um, the, the capitalism that never accepted colonialism as a good thing. Do I think that they can build those movements to overturn the status quo, to overturn, you know, colonial states, to overturn industrial capitalism? Yes, I do think that's possible. Um, and I think with that in mind, we really need to center a lot of those leaders um, and listen to what they're what they're telling us and listen to what they're asking us to do, um, because as long as it's kind of presumed that, that white movements are the normal, natural thing that we should all be following, well, that's just gonna be a dead end for all of the reasons that we've been talking about today. But I do believe that, that white people and people of privilege in general can act in, in genuine solidarity with those movements and can build movements that, that work alongside them, that create kind of genuine intersectional, gen genuine solidarity. And I think that well, is, I, is really the, the, the way forward I, that I see that's actually a plausible scenario well, to save the planet. Well, I can, I can back you up on that with a bit of South African history, which not a lot of people know about. And, uh, you know, the South African struggle has been so painted into black versus white when it was really, really, you know, more of a class struggle between rich and poor, and it just so happened that the black people were poor because that's almost the rule all over the world. But the uh, what not a lot of people know is that the the insurrection started with white people, white middle class people. The very first acts of sabotage, uh, militant sabotage, were um, middle class white people, and uh, even more interesting was they were trained by um, agents of the British Crown. They, they, spe they sent sp special um, operations uh, trainees to teach them basic s sabotage skills. And the very first uh, acts of aggression were, um, you know, uh, material stolen from mines and then used on government infrastructure, not... Uh, um, not anti-personnel, but a, a basically uh, it's almost symbolic target things. The very first thing that was hit was a radio mast. It was a, it failed, but but that marked the beginning of the successful uh, violent insurrection. And eventually, it turned out, like you said, that it it didn't matter that you know so the, you know the people in government were went from white to black. And that didn't solve anything because they still, you know, had to worry about capital flight and the capitalist system. And so nothing really changed. The whites now 
are richer the, than they were in apartheid. There's more inequality. And if anything, we're closer to, the, you know, genocide um, than we were in, in 1994. But anyway, nobody knows <laughs> that part of it. But but to, to what you're saying is that, okay, there are a couple of things there that it was the white middle class that had the privilege. Uh, they were educated people. They were um, largely communists. And they were the guys that were the idealists that started off the action that then was taken over and propagated um, into the black population. So that's, it, it did, it, in, in fact, it's, it's true in many revolutions. Kropotkin and these guys are actually aristocrats. Um, if you, you know, look in the Ukraine, if you look... Um, at uh, um, Victor Magno and stuff like that. Uh, the, the, these guys are actually bourgeois. And so they have the time, they have the resources, and you need very few of them to actually get the ball rolling. But the way I see it, and something which I think could tra travel to China, is if, if you have an underground that looks, you know, something like the Falun Gong or, you know, one, things that use... Uh, things that are already problematic for a state like the Uyghurs situation. You would use Uyghurs and you, know, you would tap into the full spectrum of really PSYOPs. So in, in South Africa, the church played a very big role um, supporting violent insurrection with, you know, liberation theology and stuff like that. But it was, um, they played a cohesive role because the church was kind of untouchable because of, you know, the, the, the Afrikaners were very religious. So they had these defenses, these psychological defenses, and they had held the cohesion together and could do a lot of stuff um, underground and, and um, you know, above ground and underground. Now, I think that if we're talking about a real global insurrection, then we've got to think in terms of a network of, you know, more like the, the anarchists of the, the 19th century, that it's a secret underground and it, it recruits radicals. You forget this idea. That the, the, there's this thing that the left's been plagued with, that we have to get consensus. We have to educate people. We have to get everybody together. This can only happen if we intersectional and all work together. And it's like, that's not what history shows. History shows that if you get a few violent radicals, they make the pick. I mean, World War One and stuff was started by the black hand. They were a tiny handful, 15 guys. So it's like these, I mean, the Bolshevik re revolution, they were down to seven guys at one stage. So these revolutions come from underground movements that are more like a spark that then basically becomes, uh, well, the timing is everything. But if you get the timing right, then they basically can, uh, can direct things. But if you start with a big movement, everything's in in the hands of the state because they, they have so much power to, as you say, divide it and conquer it. They have so much uh, ability to inter, uh, infiltrate it and to redirect it like they've done with Occupy, like all these other movements, and they probably will do it with BLM and stuff. So isn't that the way to go? Is an underground secret society or you know something like that and work from there with a single aim? And the single aim is to hamstring the machine. So I think that's one of the big things that, that has been missing in, in recent years in a lot of movements in, in North America in particular is what I know most about and I have the most experience about. I think um, I think in general, you, you know, the, the, the basis of my book, Full Spectrum Resistance, is that you need both above ground and underground movements, right? You need both direct and indirect action. And kind of the, the ratio of those things changes depending on the context that you're in, right? Um, there was Nelson Mandela who said that the oppressor determines the weapons um, that liberations movement that liberation movements must use. That's not kind of what we do isn't determined by um, our our wishes or our ideals. It's determined by what will actually work. And if a uh, um, if a government is really totalitarian, if it's a surveillance state that's very repressive, then above ground movements are not going to succeed, right? And that's the reason that we don't see many uh, above ground movements in, in China. Um, 
I, I don't know that I would say that it's always a matter of above ground movements being sparked by underground movements. I think there's a lot of exchange. I think there's a lot of back and forth. And I think, again, we, we saw that in, in China, right, that often there would be um, after the opium wars, this kind of al these alternating periods of, of upheaval and rebellion. And sometimes the movement would get really big. There would be really big movements, really big populist movements that would sometimes um, come very close to succeeding. And then if they were crushed, then they would kind of be reduced to those secret society embers, like the White Lotus Society that would keep things going, um, yeah, that would serve as kind of like... Much. The box of rebellion, yeah. exactly. So that, you know, you have these movements kind of disguising themselves, disguising themselves maybe as something else, as like phys ed groups, basically. Or, or, yeah, that's where the know. nunchucks and stuff come from. They're farming implements, right? And the right, martial yeah, arts. Right yeah, they're all, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, we saw um, in, in the so-called Arab Spring in Egypt, like a lot of the organizing came out of uh, football clubs, like soccer clubs. Um, because those were the, the pre-existing um, social structures that could kind of be energized to, to advance that. So for me as an organizer, I'm not, I'm not focused on everything being perfect. I don't think everything has to be perfectly arranged or perfectly organized or ideal. I'm more looking at like, what are the tools that we can use to advance our struggles um, that are actually available to us? And if that's soccer clubs, then great, you know, if that's organizing through churches, great. Um, and I think we, you know, we've been talking about, about the African National Congress a lot. And that was a, a kind of exceptional case where an entire movement essentially was forced to move underground because of repression. Um, and that happens. And that's one of the reasons that I think it's important for us to actually acknowledge the legitimacy of underground movements as a really critical strategy. Um, because if we don't, if you don't at least acknowledge those movements and study them, then the, you're not going to have that as an option when an emergency comes, right? And underground movements are for a lot more than overturning repressive rule, right? I mean, we've seen the history of underground movements in the Underground Railroad, for example, to help um, enslaved people escape to freedom in movements that, well, all kinds of movements that have smuggled refugees and persecuted people, whether that's people in the United States who are, you know, fleeing Latin America or, um, you know, resistors in, in Europe or persecuted people in Europe during World War II. We've seen underground movements around abortion rights. I mean, there's so many different reasons that underground movements have been absolutely critical in the history of social movements. And I, I am really worried that, um, the dominance of kind of Facebook social movement oriented activism is going, it's going to make those kinds of movements very difficult in, in the future. Um, because it used to be, you know, a hundred years ago um, or more, if we were growing up in kind of a small village um, and we, we knew everyone around us, if a foreign power came in and occupied and invaded, then they don't know anything about us. No, we know a lot about our neighbors. We know who we can trust. We know who has different skills. We can we know where we can kind of flee to or hide equipment. And Facebook, unfortunately, and systems like it have have really inverted that, right? It means that the, the government and the state know a huge amount about people and most importantly how they're connected, which is how counterinsurgency works by tracing those connections. Um, whereas people don't know their neighbors' names. Right. They could you could walk up, you know, if you're in an apartment building, a lot of people could walk down into the lobby and and not know half of the people there. Um, so that puts us in a really adverse situation in terms of building effective uh, movements. Um, so I, I, I'm a I'm a recovering engineer. So I, uh -huh. I have the opposite point of view. OK, I think that we have a golden opportunity in, in cyberspace okay. because. A, the, the state is pretty inept. The yeah. legal infrastructure is not really there. So it's kind of, um, it's the Wild West, and it's kind of uh, uncontested territory. I kind of think of the streets as kind of already lost ground, and uh -huh. we should abandon the street to the state because, you know, they've, they've got such a, a sliding scale that, you know, runs all the way from 
see us gas to nuclear. So we, we can't, we, we have to concede the, the street and move into cyberspace. In cyberspace, then it's virgin territory and we have huge amounts of opportunity. Um, one of uh, uh, the things that you cite as the surveillance state is very, very vulnerable to uh, particularly information overload and confusion. So what we're doing is we're, we're experimenting with uh, a format to actually do this kind of, uh, this kind of new kind of essentially psyops. And that's uh, basically an alternate reality game. In the meantime, I mean, I've been working on this for quite a while now, but in the meantime, we kind of got scooped by uh, QAnon because they they were doing exactly the same thing. It's it's In fact, it's standard government psyops that goes all the way back to the OSS in the First World War. So it's really just getting sophisticated and stepping up to the kind of stuff that people have been doing. I mean, like Sarkov has been doing for Putin in Russia and in the Ukraine, all the stuff that you see going on in Ukraine is monopolized by these state governments. And they're not very good at it. They're not very good at psyops. They're not very good at cyber warfare. So you say that there's, there's a huge opportunity if we can just get activists for, to stop thinking in terms of, you know, Birkenstocks and gluing yourself to, <laughs> to a window or something. It's like, get out of that. That's passe. We've got to think in terms of beating them at it's not even their game because they crap at it. But if you if you start from the point of view, I don't know if you know anything about alternate reality yet, but a few people have noticed over the years that it might be a great, great vehicle for social engineering and revolution. And, um, and so a number of people have been toying it with it, but we just saw the power of it. Um, on January the sixth, <laughs> we just we, we just had uh, had a blatant example, and it really frustrates me because it's so easy for the right to do it, but the the left is resistant to conspiracy theories. To you know, there's there's a whole lot of baggage that the left has that means they're not equipped to go into cyberspace, and I think that's the contested ground. I think that's the opportunity. Um, but may, it's getting a bit long, so do you want, just want to, you might want to tail off and <laughs> just answer that and then maybe see if anybody else has got some questions. Um, sure, and I'm happy to change gears to talk about that. I think, um, you know, to kind of combine that with, with where I was going, one of the things that's important, I think, is to make sure that young activists realize that they've got a lot of options in terms of the way that they approach activism and the way that they approach organizing. And so it's not just about going on Facebook and getting the most attention and having the most followers. That is one perfectly kind of valid way, but there are also other approaches to activism um, that, that are you know, based around kind of building networks, trusted networks. And so it sounds like that's maybe more of the direction that you're headed on in with this alternate reality game. Um, yeah, so could yeah. You, yeah. yeah. Could you tell me just a little bit more about, so like okay, I, so, so, yeah. Okay, it's very easy to, if, if you're prepared to just take the stigma, uh, is to just call it what it is. And it's, it's essentially, it's, you use cult techniques. So it's, it's a cult. QAnon is a cult. And, um, and what the left is resistant to is cults. From my point of view, I think everything's a cult. I think our, our capitalist society is a, it's a cult. It's a snuff cult. So we kind of think in terms of the fact is just call it a cult and say, you know, it's a beneficial cult because we're trying to liberate people and get them out of cultish behavior. But if you have a look at the track record of, of what cults have managed to achieve um, in terms of resistance, well, I don't want to hit any keywords, but there are a few in Japan, <laughs> the Rajneeshi, the, the, um, in fact, the Boxer Rebellion is a cult. And so the way forward is to start a cult first. So, you you know, it can be a soccer club. As a, a soccer club is a cult. Um, but, you know, you have a fan base for uh, just this really like-minded group that can be like-minded around veganism or any any issue it could be, you know, building model airplanes for, for all you care. 
but um, it those that group that has um, an ideology and then works on the principles of a cult, then at, when the timing is right, can be turned into, you know, people can be turned into Manchurian candidates has been shown easily in the past. So you, you don't start with this idea that you have to organize and rally people and, you know, do this agitprop to get everybody. This so that's thinking is so old and it's not feasible anymore because the state has uh, the antidote to all of that. So social media and getting on Facebook and getting likes for you know, save the whale or something is, it um, it doesn't uh, get anywhere. It's 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 a, it's a way of bleeding activity off uh, real, you know, um, effective measures. Um, and and so it's a way of draining a movement. If if they can't penetrate the cult and they can't uh, track it very easily, which is where alternate reality gaming comes in, because you can't tell where the game ends and things start to get real. And so the you know you always have the defense that no no it's just a game you misunderstood it, but the state understands very well that this could turn into a, an insurrection very quickly, in just like QAnon did. So. The reason why China is very sensitive about the Falun Gong and stuff is they might be peaceful and they might just have some esoteric kind of belief system and stuff, but they know very well what that can turn into in a dime. You know, they just just have one bloody incident and that uh, that immediately becomes an effective militant organization with webs that they might not not be able to penetrate. So they know the threat. Um, the thing is that. It, I don't think the left and activists know the power of this threat. And when you, when you know, now it's getting a bit easier because you've got the example of QAnon. Unfortunately, if you say QAnon, immediately the blinders go up and all the feathers get ruffled. But you say, no, that's a model as, that proved successful. I mean, how many left-wing organizations do you think are even close to overrunning the capital and <laughs> doing some political change like that? And they're... We just saw it a few months ago that that's exactly what they achieved in two years. And the investment was something like four million bucks. So it, it's too powerful to ignore. Um, so I think for me, I'll, I'll make some distinctions to start with. I think for me, there's, there's some really important distinctions between um, underground groups and, and cults or between effective underground groups and cults. Uh, and I think one of the most important distinctions is around critical thinking, that that cults, at least as they're kind of generally established, discourage critical thinking um, because they don't want people to diverge from, you know, the uh, no, no, wishes common, of... No, no, common misunderstanding. No, no, that, no, that's not really true. It's it's actually the opposite. One of the things QAnon was known for was like, do your own research, do your own thinking. I, I would say the exact opposite. I'd say most... Activist groups, uh, I mean, Extinction Rebellion is really, you know, checks all the boxes for a cult. And they they do the active suppression. But I'd say that most popular movements above ground fit into the ground of suppressing uh, freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Cults actually do the opposite. They actually, if you've been involved in them, they, they actually promote critical thinking. And they, they, they don't steer them uh, as much as just say, you know, go and do the, do the research. I mean, I don't know if that, <laughs> I don't know, for, first of all, if QAnon is representative of, of cults in general. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, I, they're great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I, I must put, send you a video on these culty programmers. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's long, but um, it, there are these guys out there that are, are trying. Uh, you know, the the former foremost world deprogrammer is making a full time job of deprogramming people from the QAnon. Right. Um, yeah. Because it's a dangerous cult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll just say that I. I don't think a cult is the right model for for effective social movements because um, because the the cults that I have seen and researched uh, are generally very opposed to critical thinking that they don't like critical thinking that they um, you know they might say go and do your research but that's actually more of a filter 
so that more suggestible people get brought in and then people who actually do genuine research leave. So it's kind of a way of getting rid of people who are gonna challenge the established status quo or the prevailing belief inside of that, that cult or that subculture. Um, well, well what, about, when, what about innovating and making it so that it, uh, a cult will accept critical thinking? Well, why don't I, let me draw some distinctions and then, uh, and then maybe the answer will become clear. I think that um, there have been, there have been social movements um, that have some of the cult-like qualities in terms of like, um, if we were to rhyme off some of those, those qualities or some of those similarities, potentially, you know, they have uh, a strong kind of esprit de corps. There's, there's, they have strong shared beliefs. Um, they're willing to take risks together. Um, but I think when when critical thinking has been discouraged in other movements, it's often been really harmful for the people involved uh, in that movement and also for their ultimate outcomes, for their ultimate goals. Um, you know, I I talk in full spectrum resistance about the, the weather underground, which I mean probably has many of the characteristics of, of a cult in, in some respects. Right, they're uh, an underground movement that often became very isolated. Um, they had very strong political beliefs that, um, I mean, you basically would, <laughs> if you didn't believe them, you would be told to leave, or you would be kind of viciously criticized. So they had this this um, form of uh, political indoctrination, I guess, called uh, criticism and self criticism which was uh, adopted they, as they saw it from Maoism. And the point is that they would go around in a, in a circle for, they would get kind of a cell together and go around in a circle for maybe 18 hours. And someone would have a chance to kind of confess to all of the ways that they were counter-revolutionary or that their bourgeois upbringing had affected them and so on. And then other people would then kind of pile on and criticize them and shout at them and, and, um, that sounds, was, it sounds like Extinction Rebellion to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, to a certain extent, I think we've we've experienced some aspects of that in, in many movements. But the, the people who, who experienced that in, in the weather underground uh, ultimately came to believe that it was very harmful um, psychologically, that it was harmful to everyone involved, that it, that it kind of undermined their ability to work as a group and their ability to get things done. Um, and the the Black Panthers, you know, they had some kind of similar issues in terms of um, the, the role of some kind of charismatic leaders who were men and who very badly mistreated women in the organization. I mean, there was a level of misogyny that ultimately helped to destroy the Black Panthers um, in conjunction with sustained police repression. So I think that that kind of, that, that some of those characteristics um, actually really undermine social movements and they play into the hands of, of the police um, or of the state. So I think that it, it's really important to um, encourage internal critical thinking and encourage that level of, of kind of mutual support because that's actually what's necessary to build movements or to build groups that can sustain themselves in the long term. And that's why I wouldn't use the term cult to describe that. Um, that said, in terms of alternate reality games in general, you know, I um, I think that getting that that getting people to look at things from a fresh perspective is really critical. So I love science fiction, um, speculative fiction. I have a science fiction novel coming out next year, um, and one of the reasons that I did that is because science fiction can get people to look at things from a new perspective, right? It can give them kind of an avenue to understand their current situation through metaphor or through a different kind of world. And I think that a big challenge that we have as organizers is that people have so many kind of automatic responses to, to any challenge to the status quo, right? There are automatic stories or automatic responses that are invoked by growing up in the cultures that we grow up in, by, by kind of continuous propaganda. Um, whether that's from, from governments or from corporations or from other sources. And so, so speculative fiction can be a way of helping people to access deeper truths 
uh, in a in a new situation um, and to learn more about um, potentially about how movements work and how movements succeed, right? And how change can happen. So I do think that that aspect has a lot of potential. Um, and I think that that interactive learning um, in the form of a game or other things, that helps people to, to learn things more deeply than they can learn just from kind of passively watching or consuming something. So I, yeah, I do think that has a lot of potential. Yeah, it's based, the alternative re reality game idea is based on uh, the research that says that people really are really susceptible to cues from their peers. And so people are very, very good at fitting in with a group and fitting in with a culture. So people really easily immerse in a culture and just adopt, adopt it. We kind of adapt, uh, adapted maybe genetically to do that. Now, compare that to what most groups are trying to do in terms of activism, and that's to culture change, where culture change is extraordinarily difficult. Any CEO of a corporation or something will tell you to try and change the corporate culture is extraordinarily difficult. So uh, the idea then is that you get um, an alternate reality game or a group that thinks a certain way and then basically um, uh, you, if you start adding people to it, then they automatically adopt those customs. And so you build outwards. So it means that you don't do the activist thing where you're trying to attract people that already think the same way. You just get, you know, really a little faction going. And this says, no, you, you start with a core uh, and build outwards of people who, who agree with the premise of fit in easily. Otherwise, uh, but, but you do cultural change from the inside out. It's completely inversed from the current thing where, you know, so say Extinction Rebellion tries to go out and reason with people and persuade them and do educating. None of that stuff works as you've written about yourself. Yeah, that's interesting. That reminds me of kind of how a crystal forms right, then you've got a solution. If you have kind of the nucleus uh, of a crystal, then other other things and solution will kind of uh, attach on in the same pattern as it grows. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so so uh, you I, use narrative fiction and, and a bizarre alternate reality because all you're trying to do is break people out of their current reality. Yes, the, yes. Uh, the big mistake on the left is you you know you have this idealism oh you have to be marxist or you have to be socialist or something like this like no you just have to be anything other than you are now you just, just <laughs> trust that if you can break the existing paradigm then people will you know all this much vaunted uh, human yeah. ingenuity will come to the fore and people will do the right thing. You don't have to be marked. All this excessive yeah. planning. That we can't get people off this paradigm until we have a better one. Bollocks. <laughs> you just yeah. need to get people off this paradigm. And then the way you get them off is for a bizarre, more bizarre it is, the <laughs> less likely some idiot is going to try and implement it. But you, yeah. you, if, if, if there's kind of protection in having it science fiction -y and bizarre is that it's too bizarre to actually get idealistic about, and you really want to right. avoid idealism. Yeah. That makes yeah. sense. Um, I do have to go soon, but maybe yeah. to finish okay. up, I can actually recommend, this is something I've never done before in a, in a social movement talk. I'm gonna recommend three video games that might be interesting to you um, in, in kind of your, and maybe provide some useful inspiration for, um, for your alternate reality game ideas. Um, okay, so I'm going to recommend, um, these are all from Eastern European game studios, which I think is not a coincidence. So one of them is called This War of Mine. Um, it's by 11-Bit Studios in, in Warsaw. And it's a, a game where you play um, a person who's stuck in, uh, in, a, in a modern day siege, like the Siege of Sarajevo. Um, a person who basically just has to survive and kind of bring together other people. Um, you're not, you know, you're not the army. You can't go and like solve all problems by shooting things. You kind of have to scrape things together and and maybe hope that you can get along with your neighbors. Um, so I, it's a it's a very interesting game that um, I think got popular because it was so good at creating a sense of empathy um, for people who are playing. 
Um, and that same studio, 11-Bit, went on to produce another um, game called Frostpunk. It's a, it's a game about climate change, but it's not about global warming, it's about global cooling. Um, it's set in, in kind of the Victorian period in which um, uh, the, the, the burning of coal has, has disturbed the climate and geoengineering has caused everything to get really cold instead of getting really hot. And so you're it's in coming. charge of, it's, yeah, yeah. So you are uh, kind of organizing a community of essentially refugees um, who are trying to survive as it gets colder and colder. And you have to deal with these um, social uh, social disputes between the, the engineers who you kind of depend on and these and the working class and these lords who start to show up as they're abandoning you know London that's been that's gotten frozen over. Um, so I think that would be kind of interesting. It's a very different way of looking at, um, essentially many of the same underlying truths, uh, underlying issues. Um, and the last game is is actually the newest game because it just got re-released. Um, it's a game called Disco Elysium. It's by a studio based in Estonia. Um, and it's it really gets into the kind of weird supernatural um, as well as um, as social movements. So you are playing um, some you're playing a character who's trying to solve a murder mystery in a city that was the home of a failed revolution. So 50 years ago, um, you know, essentially communists um, tried to create a, a nicer, a better society. And then people from uh, other wealthy countries in the world created a coalition, uh, an armed coalition to come in and, and squash the, the revolution. Um, but there are all of these other kind of interesting, supernatural, weird things going on that I think will probably resonate with um, with some of your interests in this in this work. Thank and you very much. Good ideas. Thank yeah. you. That's a good idea. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, Excellent. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. I hope we can meet again to to further on the uh, on the alternate uh, reality game one day. It would be nice. It was great meeting yeah. you. Ari. Thank you. It was great meeting you. Yeah, too. So Thanks nice so to meet you. Me. Yeah. Thank yes. you very much. Thank you. And thank you for everything you do and your work in the world. Thank you so much. Thanks. I appreciate it. Thanks for the work that you do. All right. I all hope right. you all have a great day. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Take care. Bye.